to have no disclosures. Um, so here's some evidence that we should take the time to medically optimize our patients that are undergoing ventral hernia repairs. Um, on average, there's 350,000 ventral hernia repairs that are performed annually in the United States. That's 3.2 billion in cost. And so if we can prevent 1% of recurrences, we can save us, uh, save the healthcare system an estimated $32 million. Um, there's another study that showed that Patients with preventable comorbidities undergoing open ventral hernia repairs could generally generate higher hospital charges even when no complication occurs. So the mo more comorbidities, the more significant the impact on costs. So if we can aggressively risk reduce um, these patients, there's the potential for significant savings. Uh, in addition, just doing what's best for the patient. So the four main risk factors that we should optimize, um, tobacco use, hemoglobin, A1C, malnutrition, and obesity. So I based the majority of this talk off a recently published um, expert consensus guidelines that were um, also guided by systematic review. Um, so the, basically this group of experts on ventral hernia repairs were gathered. Um, they also did a, a thorough literature search. Um, to qualify to sit on this panel of experts, you had to have performed 50 ventral hernia repairs in the last year, and also to have published or spoken at a meeting on um, hernia repairs so that you were considered an expert uh, to be invited to the, to the um, session. So first up, tobacco cessation. So the consensus from this group was that you should avoid elective surgery on current smokers, and this was a grade A recommendation. Um, you should also avoid elective surgery on patients who are, who are utilizing tobacco products, such as um, cigars, pipe smokers, et cetera. Um, you'll see down there at the bottom that there's no recommendations on e-cigarettes, and that's basically because there's no data out there yet on that, um, but most people on the panel um, in the discussion, they said that they just treated it as if they were actively smoking um, cigarettes. Um, you should require a minimum of four weeks smoking cessation before elective repair. And, you know, somewhat depressingly, the uh, preoperative smoking cessation programs are actually um, have a low likelihood of success. Um, and you may consider uh, performing nicotine testing. Um, that's a grade D recommendation, so you, they leave it up to the individual surgeon. And I did think and wanted to highlight in their discussion from this paper, this is a very strong recommendation. All panel participants agree that they would not perform elective surgery on an active smoker, ventral hernia repair. Switching over to hemoglobin A1C, so you should follow the National Institute of Diabetes and Digestive and Kidney Disease guidelines um, on obtaining preoperative um, hemoglobin A1C. I'll tell you that their guidelines to me as a, as a um, somewhat simple thinking surgeon are a little too complicated. So basically, anybody that you would suspect of having diabetes, such as somebody who walks into your clinic with obvious metabolic syndrome, then obtain a hemoglobin A1C. And we know that there's an increased risk of complications in patients who have a hemoglobin A1C greater than 6.5, and you should not consider elective repair um, in those patients without doing preoperative optim optimization. And you should avoid elective surgery on patients with a hemoglobin A1C greater than 8. Now, malnutrition, um, somewhat weak guidelines here, or weak recommendations, grade D. Um, this is a relatively new topic that's being considered um, preoperatively. So um, you should individually assess patients for malnutrition. Uh, based upon your clinical evaluation, you can consider preoperative albumin or um, prealbumin um, and then you can also consider preoperative oral supplements, including arginine and fish oils in high-risk patients that are undergoing gastrointestinal surgery. So specifically, arginine, it enhances immune function and wound healing. Fish oil is believed to lower uh, metabolic and catabolic response to surgical insult, helps with re uh, resolution of inflammation. And there's kind of questionable generalization to this for ventral hernia repair alone. Um, if you have a high-risk patient that's also undergoing a concurrent GI surgery procedure, then the recommendation's pretty strong. I don't know if we can generalize that to every single ventral hernia patient. And then I, I saved the most controversial for last, and that's obesity. So the consensus is that um, 
a BMI greater than 30 is associated with poor outcomes after a ventral hernia repair. It's a grade A, grade a recommendation. You should avoid elective surgery in patients with BMI greater than 50. And in that gray area, 30 to 50, um, you get to individualize your uh, recommendations for preoperative intervention. Um, and you, these interventions can include weight loss surgery, weight loss programs, or non-surgical interventions, but we know that non-surgical interventions for obesity have unreliable, durable success rates. So let's talk about that gray area a little bit more. Um, two other papers that looked at, that I pulled that um, looked at the risk of complications for ventral hernia repair. So significantly increased above a BMI of 40 um, in one study that was done, 5.6 uh, to 6 points to 6 percent risk with BMI um, less than 40 increases to 16.5 percent. And that's consistent with multiple other studies. Uh, there's also a group that looked at abdominal wall reconstructions in patients with a BMI greater than 30, and they have a significantly higher risk of skin necrosis, recurrence, and reoperation. So again, individualized care is necessary. So um, these can be, this can be a difficult conversation to have with patients. Uh, I found that patients with ventral hernia repairs, they really, they, they, their hernias are bothersome to them, they're unsightly, they're painful, and they're very committed to having their hernia repair fixed. And it's hard for them to hear from you that they need to stop smoking or that they need to lose weight or et cetera. And uh, I'm not one of those people who has the personality where I can just look at my patient and say, you need to lose weight. I just, I don't have that personality. So I had to learn how to talk to patients about this. Um, there were a couple of difficult conversations earlier on, early on. So I've started forming this conversation and maybe you, you can learn a little bit from my experience. Um, about risk factors. So I, I start by talking to my patients about what is some of the risk factors for hernia repair. So number one, I tell them is an incision. Um, or you know, knowing a surgeon by name is a risk factor for having a hernia repair. Um, increased intra-abdominal pressure, so I always like to throw out pregnancy first because that seems to lighten the conversation a little. And then I talk about obesity. So you have increased pressure in your abdomen that's pressing against that incision that some other surgeon has given you, and you get a hernia. Uh, weakened tissues is the third thing I talk about, so naturally weak areas at the belly button or groin, um, but also nicotine use, and then poor wound healing, <clears throat> so diabetes, immunosuppression, et cetera. So that gives me an open door to talk about ways that we can make their hernia uh, repair longer lasting, um, and I put even more emphasis on that if it's recurrent. So finally, just to summarize, here's a ventral hernia repair checklist that you should think about as you're signing somebody up for a hernia repair. Um, you can consider a urine nicotine test to confirm that they've stopped smoking. You can, and, and I do that routinely, uh, but again, that's up to you. Um, they need to have stopped for at least two weeks to get a negative test and, uh, if you're doing the urine nicotine. And then I say, you know, it's gonna take at least two weeks to schedule that patient for surgery. So they, they have been, you know, set, they've been off cigarettes for four weeks. Um, if they're diabetic or you're concerned about um, elevated glucose, then a hemoglobin A1C, you can consider oral supplements if they're high risk. <clears throat> and if they're obese, if their BMI is greater than 30, then they should return to clinic after three months of weight loss for reconsideration. And um, I kind of see how they're doing. After three months, if they are losing a lot of weight and have been successful, I give them a good pep talk and I send them out to lose more weight. And uh, I just saw a patient yesterday in clinic, actually, that I will tell you a little bit about. She had a BMI of 44 when she first came to see me. She has a um, ventral hernia repair after a diverting loop ileostomy. And um, she had a, a closure and then it came back. Um, her repair came, her, uh, Peristomal hernia came back, and uh, anyway, so she wants. She's very committed to getting this repaired. It looks bad. She has a lot of episodes of constipation regarding this. So she went out and she lost down to BMI of 39, and she comes back to see me in clinic, and um, she feels great. She's like, I feel wonderful. I was supposed to have a procedure to have all the nerves in my back blocked on Friday. I canceled it because I lost 20 pounds, and now I don't have any more back pain. And so she's going out to lose more weight come back again in three months. So you really can improve just more than their abdominal wall um, whenever you optimize these patients before surgery. So.